Welcome back, Tom Hartman here with you. And uh, on the line with us is Richard Lang. Richard is the uh, a pioneer in the technology industry. He's the founding CEO of Democrasoft uh, and, and author of the new book, Virtual Country. Virtualcountry.us is the website. You can tweet Richard at uh, Richard uh, ATDS or at Democrasoft. Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having me. Sure. Am I pronouncing everything right here? Oh, uh, yeah. Democrasoft, that's it. Cool. And, um, yeah. so, so tell us about your book, uh, Virtual Country, Strategy for 21st Century Democracy. What, what, what is it that you're proposing that would be uniquely 21st century about uh, your reinvention of democracy or how to, how to have this? Well, interestingly enough, uh, today's Lincoln's birthday, and at the beginning of a chapter that answers that question, I can read you Abraham Lincoln answering that question. Go for he it. Said, he said, what I want is to get done what the people desire to have done. And the question for me is how to find that out exactly. Okay. So, mm -hmm. you know, for the last... 240 plus years, we've had three branches of government as set up by our founding fathers. But there's been one thing missing that entire time, uh, mostly because it hasn't been possible to have it before, and that is a single, coherent, collective voice for we the people to weigh in on issues that affect us all, that, that affect our, our future, the planet, and to be able to do so in an advisory manner any day of the year. Uh, not have to wait for two years to have another election and vote for someone else to represent us, but to have that say directly as a collective voice. So virtual country is uh, essentially a, a, a proposal for how we, the people, can actually set up a non-governmental, non-profit, non-partisan, which is important, issue-based way to weigh in on the very issues that affect us and in so doing just bypass the the uh the broken system and speak for ourselves collectively so how do you deal with the corruption of private systems like this and, and we're certainly seeing this with with everything from super PACs to uh now you know since the buckley decision in 76 said it was uh first amendment free speech for billionaires to own politicians and then you know the scotus doubled down on that with both mccutcheon and Citizens United, how do you how do you prevent astroturf organizations from coming along and uh, you know selling BS ideas, you know uh, promoting <laughs> you know what, whatever it may be. I mean school vouchers or something like that, and 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 pouring millions of dollars into public relations, into you know Twitter and and Facebook ads and whatnot to try to corrupt your process. How, how, you know people do not seem immune to that. You know witness who's in the White House right now. Right. No, that's right. And, uh, you know, the reason that this is a book as opposed to an article is because I've had devoted a fair amount of time to that. But, but the short version is that it's somewhat counterintuitive that by setting up what is essentially would be a, a public utility, um, we this is not the, an idea for a social network. This is not uh, this is not an idea for how people can bring in their own links and their own news and debate and have a profile. This is a, a, a the a national institution that's being proposed that has one function, and that is to serve as a a venue that is protectable because it's a single venue dedicated to one thing only, and that is the collective voice. So. You know, within that, it's what uh, sometimes is referred to in technology as a walled garden, that uh, there's a voting module that presents an issue to the public. That module does only two things. It, it sets up and educates the public as to that issue, and then it provides them with an opportunity to weigh in in moderated conversation, and then it's to cast a vote. But there's no opportunity for a Facebook profile, for trolls, for bots, it's really a new start. It's an opportunity to reinvent what what uh, uh, advisory say from we the people although the, can the, look the, like. The question it's itself, Richard, is going to be subject yeah. to bias. I mean, for example, are you going to if you're going to have a debate about the inheritance tax, are you going to call it the death tax? If you're going to have a, cha a debate about you know migration policies, are you going to refer to the family reunification policy that has gone by that name for over a hundred years, not just in the United States but all over the world? Uh, using this new rubric uh, from the alt-right to chain migration. I mean, it's, it's like, how do, who decides that? Because very often the way that, that issues are framed, uh, the language framing of the issues determines the outcome pretty much in advance. 
Well, that's absolutely right. And what is uh, proposed in my book is really a departure from the way what we've seen happening so far, that this would be a citizen-led nonprofit that, whose nickname is Transparency. And the people who would be populating essentially initially a citizen-led roundtable of founding stewards, a couple dozen individuals who'd be recognized in their own fields, uh, who would be on opposite sides of political issues, but who would be mutually pledged to maintaining the integrity of this new institution. And so things like, you know, wording of questions and, and, and what goes in and what goes out would be done in a transparent manner within this uh, by these citizens who would not just politicians, but, you know, sports figures, uh, artists, writers, uh, commentators, educators, whose public dedication is to, uh, to transparently provide citizens with a, a new trustworthy institution that they know once they're there, uh, they can trust the information they get, they can trust the way things are worded because they can see how that all came about. Shouldn't we be able to trust our government? I mean, it seems well, like you, yeah. you, you know this. This is playing right into the into the hard right meme that, that the government is dysfunctional, the government can't be trusted, the government is broken, and and uh, therefore uh, let's turn Social Security over to Wells Fargo and Bank of America. Let's turn uh, Medicare and Medicaid over to uh, uh, you know uh, Aetna uh, and Blue Cross, and uh, you know we're, we've already turned about half of our military now over to defense contractors, more than half of our intelligence apparatus private contractors. These guys are making hundreds of billions of dollars a year in profits every year from us. You know, the, I, I would argue that it was the, this whole, uh, you know, two Santa Claus theory, Republican Reaganomics thing that broke government in the first place. We didn't have this problem, mm -hmm. you know, before the Grover Norquist of the world came along shilling for the billionaire class. And, you know, and David, David Koch ran for president in 19, or for vice president in 1980 on the libertarian <laughs> ticket on the platform of what I just described, and Social Security, and Medicare, and Medicaid. And, and the main meme was you can't trust government. Why would we want to be buying into that and promoting that instead of trying to repair the government that has been so badly damaged by these billionaires' shills? Well, I don't think it's one or the other, first of all. That, and one of the reasons it's called virtual country is because uh, this is an initiative, a strategy that says, you know, yes, it's good, it's important to resist what's wrong, and, and it's wonderful that people all over the country are doing that. But the idea that we're going to fix government, the, the idea that we're going to, um, that the very people who have been corrupted by a system that in essence is rigged against we the people, the idea that that those people are going to somehow change their own system to make it possible for we the people to have a, a greater say and a greater, more importantly, influence on them is not realistic. So, you know, this happens in parallel. This is not a, govern, a governmental undertaking. You know, this is a citizen-led initiative uh, underway. And so uh, this happens in parallel. It's resist on the one hand, but at the same time, we need to not just be activists, we need to be proactivists. How do you get the, how do you, we, we just have, we just have 30 seconds left here. How, how do you get sure. the buy-in from people who voted for Bernie Sanders or people who voted for Donald Trump? Well, uh, what I can say is that this takes it out of the partisan realm. It's an issue-based democracy. I would highly recommend that anyone who has an interest in this, which obviously if they're on your show or listening to your show, they do, to go to virtualcountry.us because these are fantastic questions. They're addressed in detail, and it is a conversation that is already starting to include Americans across the country. So uh, Fascinating I'm stuff. happy to recommend that. Okay, Richard, Richard Lang is the author. The book is Virtual Country, the website virtualcountry.us, and you can tweet him at uh, Richard at DS uh, or at Democrasoft. Uh, yeah, yeah but actually, it's, it's at Richard Lang 77. Okay, at Richard Lang 77. Thank you. Richard Lang, great work. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, sir. Yep, Thank we'll you. be right back.